Well, thanks everyone for, for, for being here for our discussion today on, on trade. Uh, I really hope to make it a very lively discussion, and we've got a great group of panelists here uh, to facilitate that. Uh, let me quickly introduce everyone uh, before we get started. I'll start uh, over on that end uh, with my good friend, Beth Balton from USTR. Uh, we're also joined by Kenneth Kang from the IMF, um, from Anahita Toms from Baker McKenzie, and uh, Rupert Schmegelmelch from DG Trade. Uh, and to tee up our, our discussion today, what I'd like to do first is take a couple minutes and introduce a paper uh, that I worked on with uh, Niles Graham with the Atlantic Council uh, about TTC, IPEF, and the road to an Indo-Pacific trade deal. And what we tried to do with this paper was really look at the different frameworks that the Biden administration is negotiating, try to assess where we think they're on the right track, and also look at where we think there's room for improvement and how can we get the most out of these various initiatives. And I want to start with the good, and I want to start with the positives. And I think, first of all, uh, kudos to the administration for just being in the game. And I think the vibe here uh, this week, since I've been in town, is, is great. And I think the transatlantic relationship is on a very good footing. And I will say, as someone who was in the Trump administration, this was something we didn't prioritize enough, and I'm really glad to see us uh, being able to put aside some of our differences and longstanding di disputes and work towards um, a, a place where we're working together. I think you can see the same thing happening in the Indo-Pacific. And people have different views in the United States about the TPP, but I think we can all agree that withdrawing from the TPP without a viable economic framework for the region was a mistake, and I'm glad to see the administration tackling that head-on. Uh, another virtue, I think, to their approach is the flexibility. And the TTC in particular was remarkably flexible. We didn't envision Russia and Ukraine being such a big issue when this was formed, and it was able to pivot very quickly and produce some really high-level results when it came to sanctions, when it came to export controls and, and issues of that nature. And if you look at the IPEF, you have uh, the whole nature of the framework is meant to be flexible. You have flexibility in terms of what are the different commitments and the pillars that countries can join. And then even within the individual pillars, uh, there is some flexibility based on their level of development. And I think it's really good to see the administration embracing an approach that isn't one size fit all because it lets us make progress with a lot of different partners who may not be ready for a more comprehensive agreement. And then the third virtue, I think, is really the scope. And, and going beyond what we think of as traditional trade agreement issues and looking at things like ac export controls, looking at things like investment screening, and then tackling what is one of the big challenges of today, which is the issue around supply chains. Um, so that's the good. <laughs> now, where do we have advice uh, and recommendations for improvement? <clears throat> We have a lot <laughs> in this paper, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but I would encourage you to read it, and as you do, think about it in terms of three major themes. The first one is how do we raise ambition within each of these frameworks? The second is how do we create synergy between what's happening with the TTC and what's happening in the Indo-Pacific? How do we avoid the spaghetti bowl effect where you have conflicting rules and standards in different, different areas? And then third, how do we actually look towards tomorrow? How do we get back to a place where we are really doing true comprehensive trade deals again? And how can we create these for us so that they're a stepping stone to that? And then we get very specific in some of these areas. And I'll just mention a few that I think are notable. First on the TTC. Great job, as I mentioned, on Russia. Uh, let's build on that. Let's build on the success we've had on coordinating export controls when it comes to China. Let's build on that when it comes to investment screening. And let's look at harvesting some of the good things we had in the Trump administration where we were trying to coordinate on rules around non-market economies at the WTO, what we were calling uh, the trilateral process with Japan. So I'd like to see more of that on China. I also think we can't be shy about dealing with today's bilateral trade irritants. And I get it. We don't want to relitigate Boeing. We don't want to relitigate biotech or hormones. But there are issues in our relationship today that could be tomorrow's trade war if we don't get our arms around them. And I think from a U.S. perspective, I think about the EU's digital agenda and the way that that targets certain U.S. companies. And I think that should be fair game. 
And I think uh, Rupert's going to tell us in a, in a minute what some of the things are that the EU would want to bring in, into the equation. But I think it is fair game to look at some of the U.S. localization policies, to look at maybe some of the policies that the U.S. has around clean energies, and, and in particular, the electric vehicle tax credit. Um, the two other things I'll mention on the TTC is, uh, in terms of synergy, I, I would also like to see some of the same supply chain commitments in IPEF done with the EU. And then in terms of building towards a future where we can have a comprehensive agreement, I'd like to see if we can do an early harvest from some of the things in TTIP where we had agreement before the negotiations broke down and whether or not those are things we could still look at doing. Turning to IPEF, uh, the big issue, of course, is, is market access. And the U.S. Has, has decided that they don't want to put tariff cuts into the equation for this agreement. And I think a lot of folks look at this, uh, the U.S. business co community and, 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 our, and our trading partners, and I think there's a real question about whether the U.S. can truly achieve its goals around supply chain resilience and its goals about reducing reliance on China if it doesn't have market access commitments. And remember, there's not a blank slate in this region. We've already got the CPTPT. We've got RCEP. And so how are we going to compete with tariff-cutting agreements when we don't put those on the table? It's very hard to see. I also don't see how we're going to get the high level of standard, uh, st high level of commitments on labor and the environment that we'd like to see from our trading partners without the promise of U.S. market access. So that is our big recommendation when it comes to the IPEF, uh, but recognizing that that may not be possible today or tomorrow, we also look at different ways in which we could replicate uh, market access in the short term through regulatory harmonization, customs uh, procedures, and maybe even looking at infrastructure financing. Um, again, on the synergy front, I would also like to see an export control component there because if you look at who do we need to be working with to deal with what I saw up there in the survey about denying technologies to China that we're concerned about, we need to be dealing with our partners in the Indo-Pacific like Japan and, and, and Korea. So let me just Turn over to the, the panelists in a second here. I know they're going to have um, a lot to say in response. But, but what I, where I want to conclude is, is I want to make two quick points here. One is on the political viability of this. And I know a lot of people may listen to me speaking and say, this is totally unrealistic. How could we actually do this uh, when our public is skeptical of trade? And in the U.S., I have an easy answer for you, which is remember this agreement called NAFTA that was super unpopular a couple years ago? Well, what did we do? Uh, Ambassador Tai worked very closely with the Trump administration, found a way to address some of the challenges around labor, environment, outsourcing, issues like that, and had the, the strongest bipartisan vote that we've had in years for a trade agreement. So it is possible, and I think we can do that again. And then why does this really matter to the EU? I think if we're being realistic about the WTO, it's not meeting the challenge of setting new rules. And so if we are really going to find a way to create a set of rules that's based on our values and to spread that globally, we need to look at other alternatives. And I think we need to go to China's backyard, which also happens to be the fastest growing region in the world, and figure out if ultimately, once the U.S. can get its head around a high standard agreement, can we get Europe to join as well? And so that's where I really think we need to be thinking about for the future. Um, so enough from me. <laughs> Um, I know there are going to be lots of comments from our, our panelists on, on, on what I've had to say, and uh, I look forward to that. And, and Beth, let me start with you. Um, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about the administration's approach to trade. And one of the things you frequently said is that you felt, and, and your administration feels, that in the past we have often um, prioritized efficiency over resilience. And I get that. I think there's some, some truth to that. And that maybe we do need to look at new approaches. But my question to you is this. If we're talking about resilience in the sense of having a diverse set of supply chains, if we're talking about, as I understand it in the U.S. context, about reducing our reliance on China for critical goods, how do you do that if you don't have market access commitments as part of your Indo-Pacific strategy? Great. Thank you so much, Cleet. Uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, it's great to be here today. And let me just explain a little bit of context about my position. I'm a senior advisor to Ambassador Tai. This is a huge time of change 
Uh, this conference is an example of, of how we are all trying to come together to figure out where to go in this extraordinarily dynamic environment. And so my, she has two senior advisors. We operate as an internal think tank for the ambassador to try to help think through some of the, the challenges that, that Pete has identified. Let me just say a couple of things. Um, first of all, we tend to think of market access as tariff liberalization. They are not necessarily the same thing for a couple of reasons. Uh, for a long time at the GATT, we did tariff liberalization, tariff negotiations. In 1974, Congress authorized the executive branch in the United States to negotiate what we call non-tariff barriers, behind the border barriers, precisely because you could negotiate tariff liberalization agreements that were then undone through these other measures. So we want to think about market access very holistically, and I think you'll see in the, in the TTC, is that not working? Is it on? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, sorry, do I need to repeat? I know we, we have a little bit of time. I could hear you. Okay. <laughs> folks hear Hopefully what I was saying? Hopefully most folks could. Yeah, okay. All right, good. Um, so I think we have to be very clear about what we mean by market access. There are many provisions in the agreements that are being discussed in the fora that exist that do go to market access. Um, so something like in agriculture, uh, non-tariff barriers are more of an issue for small agricultural companies than the tariff barriers because it's binary. You either access that market or you don't. You don't have that sort of tariff margin to play with. So I think it's really important for us to be clear about what we mean by market access. Um, and secondly, on the question of tariff liberalization, I think one, there's one sentence in the paper that I would love for us to be able to talk about, which is that the TPP would have reduced our supply chain dependency on China. And I think this is an issue where it's extraordinarily technical. You have to be conversant with the product-specific rules of origin in TPP to know the truth of the matter is a lot of the industrial rules in TPP allow more than 50% of the content to come from non-TPP partners. This was a huge issue when I was on Capitol Hill when TPP was being discussed. So if you're talking about diversifying your supply chains, you don't want it to just be the finished product. You want to think about the entire supply chain because if you have a supply chain that's got 2,000 components and any one of those components is concentrated in one particular location, you haven't really succeeded in diversifying. So um, I'd love to talk more about efficiency and resiliency and all of those things, but I'll, I'll perhaps leave it there for now. Uh, th thanks, Beth, and, and, and that's great. And, and I think an area where you and I would agree would be that if it were to become viable for the U.S. to rejoin the TPP, one of the things we would need to do is to take a hard look at those rules of origin and figure out if we could make them more workable from our standpoint. And that's exactly what we did in NAFTA. And, and which is why I, I sort of hold that out there as a model and, and maybe a hope um, of something we could, we, could, we could look at in the future. Um, Rupert, I wanna, I wanna go to you next and, and, and talk about the TTC. And as, as I mentioned, I think everyone in this room will agree, great job on, on Russia. And, and really that's something to be proud of. And I think it was, was made possible by this, this fora. But, but let's talk about what's next. And, you know, there is some concern that the discussion, in particular around China, hasn't progressed as much as, as many in the U.S. would have liked to have seen. So I'd just like your opinion on where do you think we go next here? Does China become more of a focal point? Is it something else? What's, what's your view? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Cleet. And before I do that, uh, <laughs> take my liberty to jump the question a little bit. I'd like to say maybe one word on the context. Um, you know, right, because five or ten years ago, you would not have invited somebody, a trade nerd like me, <laughs> to a geoeconomic <laughs> conference. At the time we were doing trade, I was actually 10 years ago finishing negotiations with Ukraine on the free trade negotiation. We had no idea about the geopolitics of that agreement as it then played out later on. Five years ago, or a little bit more, Sima Gabriel is in the audience, we were having a TTIP Beirat. Das war eine unglaubliche Veranstaltung über Kulturhoheit and other things. We were talking about trade rules in our silo, there was a geopolitical element to work closer with the US, okay, but that's always been there, the transatlantic relationship. Because we are the biggest trade and investment relationship in the world. Even at the time, we said our relative weight is shrinking, so we have to do better to leverage that. And this geopolitical element, of course, now 
has come out to the fore in a completely different way. We had a much more increased rivalry between the US and China, which hit us on export controls, for example, because we're not part of the conversation. We had the pandemic. Resilience became a huge issue, not only vis-a-vis one particular country. I'm going back to your question soon. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> no, resilience is also active pharmaceutical ingredients from India, for example. And then we had the question of security, which was really not the, the way it is now, because we now have <clears throat> not only our trade, which our trade policy was meant to be efficient, just in time, don't care much about the rest. Now we have this triangle, you want to be efficient because that's jobs, that's growth, let's not forget, and that's why tariffs are important. You want to be resilient, and there might be a clash. If you really want to be resilient, it might not be as cheap. No? And you have security where you're actually thinking about decoupling, although there is a business case. In that triangle, we now have to work, and trade policy is now part of it. It's no longer, as we saw, something uh, somewhere down there. And this is why we came up after we saw that for political reasons, domestic reasons in the US and the EU, TTIP would not go forward, which was a great project, I have to say, but there we are. You have to deal with what you have. We came up with this new form at the Trade and Tech Council at the nexus of trade, security, and technology. Because the other thing which, of course, has happened, digital trade, digitalization, is a huge issue which permeates all areas of trade. So we came up with this format, and not to come back to your question as something which is maybe just against one particular part of the world, because there are many components in there in the TTIP format. We work on standards on artificial intelligence. That's relevant for us, but it's also relevant for China, but also Russia. We work on issues like semiconductor supply chains. That is an issue which is very much linked to China, but it's also, of course, a supply chain which is hugely complex. There are hundreds of products there, as we have seen. We work on issues like export controls, where we want to align our thinking and not be subject to each other measures, and then find out our companies have different conflicting requirements. Can you trade with this entity? What if I have components from the US in my export? What do I do with re-exports? All of these technical issues. We have a much better discussion, because we will decouple partially from China, but not there won't be a wholesale. Look at the numbers. There is not a wholesale decoupling for that. It has to be surgical, and for that we need a good discussion that TTC provides. But we also work on bilateral issues to make our trade better on conformity assessment. It's not tariffs which really hinder you these days, especially when tariffs are 3 4% between the EU and the US. You have all the regulatory, the technical regulations, how to get your product into the market, and we're all regulating like crazy in, in the EU and more than in the US, but also in the US. So there is a lot of stuff to be done, and the, tech, the Trade Council is that. It looks at the future. It's more about regulation, not so much on tariffs. It's about looking at the resilience, the security, with the other parts of the world, and making the best of the EU-US uh, deep, deep trade and investment partnership at the same time. Great. Now, there's a lot there I want to follow up on, but I want to bring in a couple of our other panelists uh, first. Anahita, I want to go to you and, and, and get your perspective from the business community that you work with in terms of how they're viewing the TTC and what some of their priorities might be and, and, and how, uh, how is the U.S. and the EU doing so far? I think that the TTC is clearly identifying the main challenges, but the real question for the businesses are how does it help me to become more resilient and to really do my business without the necessity to always over-comply, to comply with the regulations, and at the same time not to miss out on many opportunities. So what we are really seeing is, of course, there is collaboration on export controls, on sanctions, on foreign direct investment. Um, on the resilience part, I think the expectations are really high, that, that it becomes more concrete and that there is more transparency, more digital tools that will be de developed jointly. So I think it's, it's in part still very theoretical for the companies, and the expectation is to really be helpful and practical. That's helpful. Ken, let me, let me bring you in now here. And, and, and we've talked a lot about both tariffs and then also, I guess, what we would characterize as sort of you know, beyond the border issues about regulatory convergence and issues like that. And, and I guess from a more of a broader macroeconomic standpoint, how do you see uh, 
I'm not going to ask you to prioritize, but I mean, if you're thinking about the U.S. and the EU, and you're thinking about what's going on in the Indo-Pacific, I mean, how do you see these issues playing together uh, when we're thinking about what's really needed to change supply chain policy, or at least to change supply chain decisions for companies? Thanks also to the organizers for inviting me today. So let, let me touch on two issues that you raised on efficiency and resilience from the perspective of macroeconomics, and then talk about some of the issues that you raised regarding uh, transatlantic and, and the Indo-Pacific uh, framework here. So I, I think you're right that uh, you and other panelists have noted we have seen a rise in the risk of trade fragmentation arising from geopolitical and economic tensions. And this is going to create more uncertainty uh, in the trade process. Uh, this is going to have costs. Uh, at the IMF, we've done some research looking at one aspect, in particular technology decoupling or technological fragmentation. And in a scenario where the world develops technological hubs that do not fully trade with each other, you could see significant economic losses in some of these countries, up to 5% of GDP. And the most stark finding is that it's the smaller countries, it's those countries that lack access to global supply chains that will be hurt the most. And this is from a combination not just of lower global trade, but also lower diffusion of technology and access to larger markets. And this is a problem, not just for the, the hubs, uh, but for the developing world in, in particular. And the, the actual cost could even be higher, because this does not account for things like trade and financial fragmentations. And the fact that we may be moving in a transition to a, a more disruptive steady state, where there will be very heightened trade policy uncertainty and difficulties in reaching global cooperation on some of the global challenges like, like climate change. On, on the issue of um, economic resilience that, that you mentioned here, um, this is also an important issue. Um, you know, there are benefits to economic diversification. You know, we, we've done some analysis looking at, in a world that we are now with much more supply shocks, further trade fragmentation, the lack of diversification would exacerbate, amplify these shocks. If you take a, a scenario where you have a high degree of diversification, this can mitigate the impact of these supply shots by much as a half, which is fairly significant. If you look across the world, there is a high degree of home bias in importing uh, in intermediate inputs. For example, firms in the Western Hemisphere, they domestically source about 82% of their inputs. Europe does a little bit better at about 60%. But that's just that there's a significant scope for countries to diversify their intermediate inputs by importing more from overseas. So the tendency to reshore or to friendshore will only worsen diversification. It will make countries more susceptible to such supply shocks and raise the overall cost of, of production. So what does this mean in terms of the, of the way forward? I, I think the priorities are, are fairly clear. We need to really strengthen the rules-based trade system, make it more open and more predictable. Um, this, this includes going through the WTO, despite the many challenges that it, it faces. We need to have better trade dispute settlement systems. We need to have more access in new areas such as e-commerce and services. And I, I very much give credit to Clayton's paper for highlighting some of the new innovative approaches that we've seen in the TTC and the IPF. I think this could be the basis for pushing forward on a global effort to strengthen the multilateral system. And it would be very important that as these initiatives take go forward, that all countries have access to these initiatives as long as they're willing to abide by and implement fully the new common standards. Those are some really great comments. And, and Beth, I want your reaction and Rupert too, because this goes to sort of what is the U.S. goal with IPEF and how do we view these different initiatives vis-a-vis -vis activity at the WTO. And I'm a huge fan of the WTO, but I've also grown skeptical about its ability to update rules in recent years. And so... For you, Beth, and then Rupert, I want you to come in as well. I mean, how do you see IPEF, TTC, and these other uh, bodies as being able to replicate and push forward the conversation that needs to happen globally? I mean, as I said earlier, we're in a paradigm shift, fundamental change in the way we are thinking about the organization of the global economy. How do you push forward with that kind of change. Uh, very hard to do when you need consensus across 164 different members. The other point you highlighted was flexibility. We've got, my, you know, Ambassador Tai talks about globalization 2.0. We have to figure out what that looks like. Right. And that's why having these different fora with different partners, with different priorities, helps us figure out what that might look like. If I could, I'd like to come back to the point of 
resiliency and, and diversification and efficiency. And something that I think is important to take into account is we think of efficiency as the optimal use of resources. That's not necessarily what our trade regimes have incentivized. It isn't necessarily optimal use of resources. It's the cheapest cost you can get, for the most part, for an input. And that is what has contributed to labor rights suppression, uh, failure to enforce environmental rules, or even having weak environmental rules in the first place. And the governments have been able to compete on that basis. That's what we mean by the race to the bottom. It's why you see very, very concentrated supply chains in certain regions that leads to the conversation about diversification um, so that you're not dependent on a single source of supply for some of these inputs. And so that's part of the reason, uh, Khalid, it's been bipartisan since 2007 that the United States has put uh, labor and environmental rules and its agreements uh, enforceably, and I believe the European Union is moving in that direction. But I think it's really important as we think about cost increases to fully account for the fact that externalities haven't been priced into the current cost structure. And so, yes, the prices will look higher. The goal, I think, should be that we are pricing in externalities like labor and like environment. So, so Beth, I, I agree with all of this, but I want, I want to push you just a little bit here. I, I accept everything you say, and, and, I, and I think that my, the conclusion I draw from that is we do need to have higher level standards on labor environment in our trade agreements. But I don't see how it then follows that we're keeping traditional market access and tariffs off the table. Um, I, I don't think you'd suggest that our tariffs are designed in a way that fully accounts for externalities. I, I think that that's something you would do through other means. And, and I also, I, I have the tariff chart here. I was just looking at this, and, I, and I've heard you say before, you know, the U.S. tariffs are so low, so it's not really that big of a deal to other countries. And, um, <laughs> you know, when you talk to them, they, they may have a different answer. So, again, I'm just trying to understand. I get it that we need a new paradigm. But why are we taking away elements of the old paradigm that I'm not sure, I'm convinced, were part of the problem? Uh, so, so how would you respond to that? So if you look, I'm so sorry, I'm going to come back to rules of origin. You know, it, it, how many are there? 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 product-specific rules of origin in any given trade agreement. One of the reasons TPP was 6,000 pages long is all of those market access commitments and the rules of origin you have to reevaluate every one of those rules, at least in the sectors you care about, through the prism we're talking about right now, which is what do we mean by resiliency? And so when Ambassador Tai says that the old model of trade agreements doesn't factor in supply or chain resiliency, that's part of what she means. It's a huge project for us to undertake. And so uh, I think we have to be cognizant. And I, yeah. I don't think you want to lead with something you're not sure you can deliver. So you and I are going to have a lot of conversations about rules of origin in the future. I can't wait. <laughs> Nobody's but ever said that Rupert, to me. Rupert, let me, let me bring you in, in here to sort of talk about the EU view on, on the Indo-Pacific. And how do you see that? Um, and, and is there an opportunity for us to be working together to pr be promoting our values around labor and environment in, the, in that region? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Again, I'm going to skirt your question a little bit because you also asked about the WTO. <laughs> I think for the non for those who don't work with this every day, I just want to make one point how important the World Trade Organization is. Because there is no sovereign right to ship your goods anywhere in the world under certain rules unless you have a, an agreement, which is the WTO. I'll give you a very practical example of a scare we had six months ago. Some countries came back to this idea, oh, we have tariffs on goods, why not have tariffs on data, data flows? We have e-commerce, it's free. But there is no rule except the moratorium in the WTO not to impose something because of the huge flow of data, which is more and more important. You think, hmm, that might be a revenue. And I might also control some other things, by the way, about the stuff I don't want to have to come in. There is only the WTO which has any rule on that unless you have a free trade agreement. We don't have that with China, for example. So just be aware, this is not theoretical. The rules-based system allows the German machinery industry to ship their stuff around the world and protects you against export restrictions as well. We've seen this in the food security crisis to some extent. 
actually there are no, not very much, many rules on that, but there are some rules. You can stop shipping your grain to other parts of the world. You can do nothing about it unless you have rules. In our FTAs, for example, the EU, you also look at the export side a lot because we import a lot, a lot before we can export again. So just to make this, sorry, this little yeah. point, I think that's why we, we believe that WTO has to be strengthened. We can do stuff in free trade agreements, and the EU is much more active still than the US. We are now negotiating with India, with Indonesia, coming back to your part of the Indo-Pacific. We have a two-strong uh, uh, strategy. We want a rules-based approach with those countries where they're ready to go in free trade agreements. Vietnam is a good example. We have that. We have Singapore. We're negotiating with some others. But we also want this other conversation about the other issues, which are more and more seen as being part of the trade, labor, environment. You know, you can't just tell your people we're going to sell everything and import everything without any of these considerations. It's becoming a very strong, very strong element of equity in the global system, globalization. And for that, we have also an Indo-Pacific strategy. We have discussions not as organized as the U.S. has with these regions, but we also have these discussions, and we try actually to join forces to impress on these countries that their long-term viability in trading palm oil or whatever it is into the EU depends also on looking at labor environment uh, because that will be an in, a clear demand. And you will, you, as you know, Lieferkettengesetz in Deutschland, as you know, the EU is doing something similar. There will be regulation here, which is not a trade regulation. It's a single market regulation. We just don't want this stuff any longer. But that, of course, affects trade massively. So your question on what the TTC could do better, because you're also asking whether we can improve, and I'm sorry if I'm too long. I have to apologize to the panelists. The TTC is preparing many of these discussions. We have a very intense labor dialogue now in the TTC, should be mentioned, innovation, the transatlantic labor dialogue, which looks at our experience in trying to help environmental rules elsewhere in the world, labor rules elsewhere in the world, but which also looks at what is interesting for our workforce. We have a discussion on the impact on AI on the workers in the EU and the US because this will have an impact on the future bigger discussions if we see that we can't control this. We also have discussions on AI, how to measure and how to risk these things because we want to be sure that we have trustworthy AI in the EU and the US. And this comes back to the point that President Lagarde made. Medical data, for example, how much do you allow data mining on this? Do you want an advertisement for a product every day or a doctor calling you because they know somebody found out what you're having? Okay, I've been very long, but it, it is the real world. It's practical on many of these issues that you mentioned, but it will take a while to trickle down. So, so Rupert, uh, um, you, you did say a lot of super interesting things, but, but I do want to just drill down and, and, and be very precise here. When we're talking about the, the TTC and sort of what's next, there's a lot of different things you mentioned. What do you think about some of the ideas that, that, that I had put on the table about the specifics and, and, and talking about issues that are emerging today? I mentioned digital. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the European Union's view on that? And are there issues on the U.S. side that you, that, that you think should be brought in that the U.S. has resisted? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the TTC should be the embryonic, if my, in my view, thing which we didn't get in TTIP, which is a more institutionalized relationship which looks at all these issues. Digital is in there. We talk about all kinds of digital issues. AI, I mentioned we also talk about... But the European yeah. Union's digital strategy specifically is what I'm asking about. Yes, well, we are talking now about the implementation of our legislation on the Digital Markets Act and the Digital uh, Services Act, which are the two key implementation issues where we, at one, have competition rules for big platforms and we have rules for platforms on hate speech and other things. That has caused some angst in the U.S. I think we have actually made clear with the final product it does not only catch U.S. companies. That is part of the discussion. Digital is part of the discussion. There's also climate change, which we would like to talk a lot more, more. Climate change is the other huge issue we have to address. The TTC talks about carbon measurement methodologies. It talks about green charging infrastructure. It talks about a few of these issues, but it could do a lot more here. Okay. Uh, Anahita, let, let me go to you. And, you know, we've, we've, we've danced around it a little bit in the context of the TTC, maybe, maybe intentionally, uh, sort of what I, what I call the China issues. Um, but there are issues, I think, that, that are being discussed or hopefully will be discussed more around export controls and investment screening. At least that's in the, the mandate. So I, I'm interested in what you think the appetite right now is from the German business community on some of those issues. 
And I, I will be honest and say historically, the U.S. Has, has felt that it would be difficult to coordinate with Europe on China-related issues because of <clears throat> Germany and, and, and the reliance that they have as an export market. Do you think that's shifting, or is there still resistance to really talking about some of these things and maybe moving forward in some of these areas? I think it depends on what type of companies you're talking about and whether we're talking inbound or outbound. So, of course, there is a lot of pressure from the business community on market access, liberalization, international, uh, intellectual property rights, data privacy challenges. So I do see a dialogue between the Commission, the German Parliament, business community, um, on those points. When we're talking about foreign direct investments into Germany, um, I see a, a more nuanced landscape because, of course, German investors are still very cautious. You know, there is not much capital invested into uh, higher risk markets. Um, when we talk about the, the digital startups, the startups of the future, we do see that necessity of, of, of more investments. And there I see, of course, the German Foreign Direct Investment um, Authority, the competent authority is the German Ministry of Economics, being much more strict than 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago when I started advising companies on, on foreign direct investment um, controls. But uh, it's still a very open-minded perspective compared to, I mean, if you look, if you try to compare it with CFIUS, uh, I think uh, the, the, the German authorities are still the, the investor-friendly, I would say. I think to one point that also Rupert alluded to, and which, which goes into the same direction uh, to your question, is we now have a German Supply Chain Act that will come into place 1st of January which, which covers all companies in, the Europe, uh, in Germany that have more than 3,000 employees, and one year later, uh, all companies that have one, more than 1,000 employees. And that relates to the sustainability in the supply chain, not only related to environmental issues, but also related to human rights issues. And I think that is what I'm seeing changing, you know, from, from soft law, from talks and, and policy-driven things to concrete laws, concrete obligations that companies have to abide with. And I would say one thing that I think is really key. The companies that I advise, from the CEOs to the chief compliance officers and general counsels, they really want to comply with these laws, and over, most of the times they actually over-comply. But I think what is really key is we need to, again, sorry to, to come back to it all the time, it has to be practical. The companies need to know what they have to do, what is my obligation, and how on earth can I understand what's happening on the ground in a remote country if it's a tier 2000, sorry to ex exaggerate a, a little bit, but clearly understood my tier one uh, supplier. Maybe tier two, maybe tier three, but Look at the automotive sector in Germany. It's really uh, challenging for the company. So I expect from the European Commission, from the German government, in cooperation with the United States, to really understand better who are the, the suppliers we need to be careful of, which are the regions we have to be more careful of, mm -hmm. and not generalize it too much, because the red flags, according to the German Supply Chain Act, and I will conclude with that, is... If you have substantive knowledge, then you have to. But then it says, if there is an article in the news, you must have read it. I mean, there are so many news articles, as we all know, uh, that discussed human rights infringements all over the world. From, from, I mean, seriously. So I think we need practical guidance, and I think companies will then be more than happy they don't want to have human rights infringements in their supply chain, most of the companies. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, a lot of really helpful uh, insights there. 
Ken, I want to bring you in on, on this. I and mean, we've been talking a lot about issues that I think are really outside the WTO. And, and whether it's um, issues that the WTO hasn't yet confronted in these areas of labor um, and, and the environment. And, and we're also just talking about negotiating for the TTC and IPEF. So my question for you is, is first of all, you know, what, what do you see as the IMF's role in engaging with these sort of independent discussions? But then secondly, what is your advice economically in terms of what could be some of the implications of the things we're talking about here? And, and is there a macroeconomic impact? And, and going back to this question of efficiency versus resilience, you know, what is it, what is it really going to, to do? And, and, and how does that affect everyday uh, businesses or consumers? Sure. I, I, I think you, you raise a, an interesting issue, an important one on market access and how this affects uh, countries around the world, not just those countries that have the access. Um, market access trade is an important driver of economic prosperity and jobs, not just for the low-income countries, but also for the advanced economies as well. Um, one of the great puzzles in, in the global economy and also of, of great concern is that economic convergence, that is poor countries catching up to richer countries, has slowed and in some cases has even reversed. And that could be very much due to the pace and nature of, of globalization as we see now. Um, it, it's important to keep in mind that it's not just um, trade policy that matters here, domestic policies matter as well. But trade has a very important component here, a very strong influence. Uh, external pressures can incentivize countries to adopt the right policies, to follow common standards. Um, for countries in particular where trade restrictions are, are significant, they have much more to gain through their own domestic policies than through their forms of trade policies in other countries. And here I think trade reform and other trade agreements can help push that, uh, that along. Now, you raised a question about the, the IMF. And you're right, the IMF has long advocated a stronger rule-based multilateral system for the reasons that Rupert mentioned. But at the same time, we do advise countries and regions in our surveillance. Uh, for example, we advised China on the reforms of the state of enterprises. Uh, we recommended the U.S. to pull back the tariffs imposed in 2018. Uh, we advised countries to adopt the WTO-based agreements in the new areas like technology, investment, and services. Uh, and we also support um, many of the new trade agreements that we think are heading in the right direction, such as CPTPP, in fostering a stronger global multilateral framework. Thanks. Uh, I'm told we're going to go to the audience. Uh, so if anyone has any questions they want to direct towards uh, one of our panelists, uh, I guess please raise your hand and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll turn to you. Cleet, while we're waiting, do you mind if I just jump no, in and people can think, in, of, can think of their questions? And, and don't be shy. Um, <laughs> Anahita, it goes to a point that you were making about companies and companies concerned about risks in their supply chains and not wanting to have human rights violations. And Cleet, this gets back to your point about IPEF. What's in it for countries to participate in IPEF? Why would they want to adopt labor and environmental rules? And I think these two seams are coming together, which is we are seeing from the investor community a real demand for more information so that they can invest in a way that is consistent with the returns they hope to achieve over the long run, and it includes uh, labor practices and environmental practices. And so for emerging economies who want investment, now that we're aware that this risk, which previously hadn't really been factored in, is so prominent, it's going to be important for them in order to attract investment to be able to demonstrate that and help you, help, help your companies see um, what their practices are. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with that. It, it, and it's very interesting how in the last couple of years we have seen it was first really environmental driven, climate change, and now investors really care about human rights violations in the supply chain as well on top of that. And I think it goes back to the resilience of the companies, right? I mean, investors want to know how risky it is to continue investing in a certain market, in certain companies, and there we need more data to really tackle the challenges on the ground. Any questions uh, from the audience? If not, I want to go back to a, a, question. a question. Oh, we have a question. There we go. Hi, uh, Doug Redeker, Brookings International Capital Strategies. Um, just because it's an elephant in the room. So, Cleet, your administration imposed tariffs on Chinese goods. 
list one, two, three, four A, et cetera. Um, and Beth, the current administration has kept those tariffs on Chinese goods, list one, two, three, four A. Um, I wonder if you can explain the rationale from a trade perspective as to why they were put on and then why we kept them on. And Ambassador Tai has used the argument that these are, le are negotiating leverage tools. And while I understand that in theory, since there are no ongoing negotiations, I'm curious, since there's an economic argument that's fairly easy to define as to why those tariffs are counterproductive to U.S. interests, why they're still on, and what the administration is planning to do about it in the future. Does the panelist want to start, or should the moderator give it a shot? <laughs> I think the imposer of the tariffs should start. <laughs> I'm, I have a this. Well, um, I look, I, I, I will make two, two comments in, in response to that, and then I'll let Beth jump in. I mean, the first is, why were they imposed in the first place? It was clearly to try to get China to change its behavior. That was our stated objective. And um, look, I think we had mixed success uh, uh, through the phase one deal. Um, we could have done better than we did, but we did get at least some reforms in, in the Chinese economy. Now, in terms of what we should do moving forward, um, I, I think the debate, I've been very frustrated by the debate about this in Washington. And you sort of, it's been a very bifurcated debate. On one hand, people will say, um, you know, the tariffs are hurt in the U.S. economy, we should get rid of all these tariffs. On the other hand, people will say, um, we shouldn't do China any favors. They clearly aren't changing their behavior, and it's politically non-viable to, to touch these things. And I think both answers are wrong. Um, what we tried to do in the beginning, especially on list one and two, was to look at them and really design them in a strategic way to say which of these tariffs are going to help um, put pressure on China and, and not harm the U.S. economy. And that's how we designed that. And I think we need to recalibrate the entire set of lists so that they're much more strategic in nature. I wouldn't get rid of all of them. I don't think that's appropriate in light of either China's behavior or our overarching objectives economically. But at the same time, I think the status quo isn't working either. And if we're being honest about it, some of these tariffs are hurting us more than China, um, and some may be hurting China more than us. So that's what I do, but it's not my choice. Um, so thanks for that question. I think the pandemic and, and then the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really drove home the, the point I've been making, which is that we're in a very fundamental shift in the way we think about the global economy. And so for years, for 30 years during the great moderation, um, it was commonplace to just assume that tariffs were always uh, counterproductive and problematic. And I think we're now in a space where we say, okay, we had that Washington consensus for a long time, now we're confronted with a circumstance in which the United States didn't have enough access to PPE for frontline workers during the pandemic. We, we weren't making masks, something, something very, very basic. And so we've got to make sure that as we think about what it means to move to a resilient economy away from an efficient economy, and that's why I spent some time talking about what an efficient economy really means, um, the types of labor practices, the types of environmental practices, as we move towards a more resilient economy, we've got to be very thoughtful about how we engage. I think Ambassador Tai has said, Cleet, to your point, um, we spent a long time doing things hoping that, that China would change. And I think we accept that that's not actually what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out how to move to a more resilient economy in the face of what we have described as detailed in the president's trade agenda in March, really what amounts to unfair competition. But I think it's interesting, and I think, uh, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but essentially what I hear you saying is that there's now a, a, a different purpose there and that it is related to our goals around resiliency as opposed to what the initial purpose is of the 301. And I would say this, it goes back to sort of just making sure we're extremely thoughtful as we move into uncharted waters, how we engage so that we achieve the goals we all want to achieve, which is a resilient economy where people aren't deprived of access to fairly basic goods, pandemic or otherwise. If I may yeah, please. add from a practice practice perspective and, and from a business perspective. I think the biggest challenge 
uh, we as the business community watching the U.S.-China trade war and then, you know, the European Union coming into it um, was, first of all, the uncertainty. H how is this going to evolve? Secondly, how quickly, compared to other policy-driven things, it happened, and the long-term investments that are in those markets. So I think what I would urge all the policymakers is please think about the indirect effects that you're having on your own economies and your allies. I agree with that point entirely. Can I, yeah, that, please come in, Robert. I'm that, curious as to... That's a very good point. I mean, think? I'll be relatively blunt here. I don't think the tariffs achieved much, to be honest. It didn't even lead to massive reshoring into the U.S. because the stuff is now coming from Vietnam, Bangladesh, and others. So there is, you know, th these companies are quite flexible to avoid some of the effects. But again, we might dispute that. The more interesting question is, how do you deal? And you know that. How do you deal with China? Because we all know... And you call it the elephant in the room. The speaker for the question was about the elephant in the room. We share the analysis that there is a massive problem with state-owned enterprises, state intervention, which is also bad for our European competitiveness in the long term. So we're working very closely with the United States, despite maybe on some of the, the points. And we haven't found the silver bullet, to be quite honest. We're trying to develop new rules in the EU about what we call the foreign subsidy instrument. So we're going to go and shield our markets from subsidies given by the Chinese in third countries, which legally we couldn't do before. So to make sure that they don't go to Indonesia, produce the things there that we have under anti-dumping or whatever. Uh, we're trying to find other tools, uh, autonomous tools in cooperation with the US on, on especially export control and investment screening to make sure that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot. But on the other hand, we need, and this is why we're here in the geopolitics, so we also need to work with China on climate change. They are very active and we need to support that. They support the solar panels. We need, even the United States saw it fit to suspend some of the investigations of trade defense, what we call anti-dumping, anti-subsidy inter uh, interventions against Chinese solar panels, but they need it for the climate change uh, policy. And we need China in the conflict with Russia because we don't want China to supply all the stuff that we are sanctioning. That needs some kind of cooperation or at least understanding. You can't all go out uh, on these issues. So it's complex. It's, and I'm not saying we have all the answers, but you have to look at the geopolitics of all of that. Building resilience is a huge issue. It's not the governments who build the, uh, the supply chains. It's companies. So, and sorry, just one more point. And resilience, one more point, which is really important, is doesn't mean that you home shore. Look at what happened on baby food in the United States. There was all produced in the U.S. There was a major fallout in one big company. And it's a combination of trade measures, high tariffs, impossible regulatory hurdles to get your stuff approved in the U.S., plus other things. So resilience is really about, uh, as we have heard, diversification, not in one country or in one region, but in a way that shocks can be absorbed. And if your cap capacity goes down in the U.S. on one product which only could be produced in the U.S., that also is not resilient. So look, there's a, there's a lot of great points here, but I, I want to ask you a, a pretty pointed question about something that was implicit in, in what Beth said. And that's, I mean, look, I think we all agree we need to work with China where we can. I don't think anyone wants a scenario where we don't work with each other because I think that leads us to a very dark place. But it seems like in the U.S., the general consensus has shifted from let's have a strategy that's directed towards trying to change China's behavior to let's accept what it is and, 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 and deal with it on those terms. Has that shift happened in European policymaking? And is the view of the commission, do we still hope that we can change China and make them more market-oriented, or are we at a recognition that that's unlikely and therefore we have a different approach? Okay, I'll be very brief because I'm, I think both. I think we have to have our own instruments, maybe not as robust as the U.S., but we, as I said, we have some things coming up. We have an anti-coercion instrument. We have an instrument which actually allows us to fight the things that China has done to Lithuania or maybe to Australia and other countries for where they weaponize trade. But we also have to work on the rules in the long term. And for that, we need maybe more than just us or the U.S. We really have to have a coalition of partners, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, yep. that, that really make the point to our Chinese friends it's in everybody's interest to play by the rules because we also have teeth. And this is what we're trying to develop in some of these. Great answer. I agree. <laughs> Question over here. We, we heard oh, 
Sorry, I didn't know there was an... I, <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. We'll get both uh, of you, don't worry. I have a question. I'm <laughs> jumping right on that topic. Uh, the moderator in the beginning uh, talked about the spaghetti ball of contradictive provisions. And I'm very much involved in harmonization of laws and regulation. Uh, frequently on the national level we talk about better regulation. On EU level we talk about better regulation. And what is your uh, suggestion how to improve all that? Where is the forum to do this? Uh, to g all together, because uh, I see that there's a certain competition who's making the better regulation or whatever the more complicated regulation, whatever purpose you are uh, you are producing it for. Um, where is the forum for it to cooperate better, because to make life easier also for business? Well, who wants to take that one on? So the policymakers, of course. Yeah, I can I can, I, <laughs> I can say two very short words. There is in the WTO you can talk about trade facilitation, which is all the rules and regulation, which are really border customs and so on. And we are trying to have an initiative in the TTC together with the US to get to paperless border and so on. But there is no body beyond the standard setting ISO and others organization where you talk about the bigger issue of regulation. There is no World Standards Council, World Regulatory Council, or anything. It's something which we don't even have in the transatlantic relationship. It's all ad hoc. We don't have an EU-US regulatory council. We tried a little bit in the past to have embryonic things. But I agree with you that fragmentation of regulation is the new tariff. All right, let's go to a question over here. So we heard that we need China. I've got a question about another European G7 country, which is the United Kingdom. Obviously, the previous U.S. administration encouraged a hard Brexit, saying you'll be first in line for a trade agreement. That stance seemed to have changed quite dramatically recently. The IMF today criticized the U.K. government for its recent fiscal policy. Does the U.K. matter, and what's the future for the U.K. in all of this? Well, I, look, I don't work for a government anymore, so I can give any opinion I'd like. I mean, I, I think the UK needs to be part of this. I was encouraged to see the UK um, trying to join CPTPP. Um, I hope we get back there with them. Um, but that's a, that's a longer conversation. Uh, in the short term, you know, there is a conversation in the US. There, I think there is still interest among some to do a trade agreement with the UK. Um, but I don't know that that's something that the administration is focused on right now. Um, Beth, I don't know if you want to weigh in and, uh, on this. Just that um, President Biden, when he was candidate, Biden, Speaker Pelosi, uh, Major Majority Leader Schumer, all said that maintaining the Good Friday Agreement was critical to our, our um, engagement with the EU, with, uh, with the UK. So uh, I think they've signaled what is a priority, um, and it remains a priority. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jan Karl Morgan. I would like to come back to the elephant in the room, China. And if we talk about geoeconomics and if we talk about technology, then the phrase geotech is, is, is upcoming in, in discussions. Um, am I mistaken that the U.S. is uh, far more ahead uh, towards the, than the European Union when it comes to containing China's or technology transfer to China? If I look at the NVIDIA regulation uh, two weeks ago, if I look at uh, the discussion about outbound, uh, outbound investment screening, which basically reads uh, don't export technology, advanced technology to China. Where are we on these discussions? Uh, is there an alignment in the process, uh, or is the uh, impression correct that the U.S. is far more hawkish on that issue than the European Union? I can give an opinion again. <laughs> uh, well, it's more addressed to me, I guess, the question now. By the way, not back to the UK question completely. On security issues with Russia, we need the UK. We work very, very well with the UK. So there's a lot of uh, um, baggage in the relationship, but on some things, some things which matter, the cooperation is very good. On trade, it's a little bit different, but this is one little part of trade, which is more security than trade. Um, on China, I think we're going in the same direction, but we have a different interest than the US. Your interests are, of course, also how much are you invested in, the, in China, how much do you trade with China, how much do you lose jobs and growth if, and, 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 and other issues. And we don't have the same uh, rivalry in certain technology areas 
honestly sometimes because we're not out there on top of technology either. So it's, it's also self-critical. If we were as advanced in some issues, we might also see things slightly different. So we have to work, but this is, doesn't mean that we are not talking every day about these issues. And we're trying to avoid that there is a scrap. And actually we're trying very, for the time being, knock on wood, we don't have major spats on the China policy. If the US chooses to curtail some outward investment into China, fair enough, that's their choice. We don't have much to say and it's not our money anyway. Uh, if it's going to be a discussion that why don't you do the same, we'll have to see. Maybe some instances we have to follow suit or have it tweak it or whatever. But the basic assumption that we have to rein in some of these Chinese policies is very strong because they hurt our industry. Look at our train, look at the development of some sectors in the US. If that happens across the industrial board, Germany will be in a very difficult spot. Beth, do you, yeah, Kenton, please come in. No, I was just going to maybe take a, a big picture on, on the issue of China and, and the other large economies. I, I know people have looked at sort of the relation between state-led capitalism and market-led capitalism. And the reality is there's something like $6 trillion dollars of trade between these two regions. It's almost 7% in GDP. It's enormous. Um, and the fact is that the trend is moving in the direction of state-led capitalism. Uh, the share of their and the global economy has increased from 20%, say, 15 years ago, to close to 30%. And that share will increase, as you mentioned, because the Asia-Pacific region is growing faster than uh, the rest of the world. So there has to be some way to find common ground, to make these two systems interoperable so they continue to benefit from interaction with each other. China needs the advanced economies. Its economy is slowing, productivity growth is slowing, it's facing an aging population, it has a large pool of domestic savings that need to expand and diversify overseas, and that can only come with help from access to foreign markets and foreign technology. So I hope very much that it happens in the future. Beth, do you want to comment on this? Otherwise, I, I did want to take... No, yeah, I was going to take the moderator, moderator's prerogative just to, to respond to this question, and then I know Josh wants us to wrap up. So I think it's a great question. I think Rupert's answer speaks for itself, and, and, and I think that we are working on it uh, together. But I will say this. I, I do think as the U.S. precedes these policies, it is critical that we do absolutely everything we can to get the European Union on board. And, and there is a tendency right now in the U.S., I think it's a bad tendency, to say we're going to go unilateral first and they'll follow later. And what that ends up doing is it, it misses the mark on our objective because if, 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 if European companies aren't subject to the same controls and Japanese and Korean companies aren't subject to the same controls as ours, all that happens is we shift supply chains away from the United States and China gets the same technology elsewhere. So I think the U.S. needs to do everything it can to co coordinate multilaterally on that, which is why I keep pushing this as something that I think is so important. And on outbound, I don't know where you guys are at. I hope it's something you'll positively consider because my view from the U.S. side would be to the extent that we're talking about plugging holes in our export control regime and to the extent we're talking about an issue where we are financing the development of indigenous technology that does the exact same thing we're trying to control through export controls, we should put a stop to that. Because if it's a national security threat because we're sending it to them, it's also a national security threat because we're funding it through our private equity and our venture capital. But once you start talking about supply chain management as an outbound investment mechanism, I get very worried about that and what, what we're getting into. And I, so I'd like to see it stay focused on national security. I think that's where our administration is going. I think our Congress has some different ideas, and hopefully they'll, they'll show some restraint. Um, so with that, thank you. I, I know I give enough recommendations in the paper. I couldn't resist two more at the end here. But thank you, everyone, for, for your attention. And thanks to a great discussion with a great set of panelists. I really enjoyed it. I hope you all did, too.